All of the best psychological horror is themed around a fear that works its way into everyday life, but that we don't tend to think about during everyday life. The fear of sex, the fear of your father, the fear of God, adulthood, humanity, the mirror. But there's one source of fear that I've never seen a work dedicated to. The fear of motherhood. The love that a healthy, functioning mother feels for her child is abundant enough to be truly terrifying. Oh, Every night, my mother says that she loves me before she goes to bed. As a kid, I never really thought about it. But as an adult who's been able to really meet the woman, it's become clear to me that every time she says that, deep down, she's horrified that something might happen to her or myself before we get to see each other again. Then she goes to bed, where she often has dreams about my sister or I getting into a fatal car wreck, or being shot at some gas station at 3am, or god knows what else. While I've only got one mother and can't speak for the whole world, I've never met anybody who has more nightmares. And they're almost never nightmares where something awful happens to herself. They're always about my sister or I. Every time I run to the store or go grab some food, she says a little prayer in the back of her mind that nothing will happen to me. As far as I'm concerned, that's the closest everyday analog to the type of fear and paranoia that a series like Amnesia aims to create. There will be full spoilers for Amnesia Rebirth ahead. As I played Amnesia Rebirth, I experienced a sliver of that same paranoia and fear. Throughout the whole game, I was terrified. It does its job as a horror game incredibly well, but there wasn't a single point in the game where I was scared for myself. All of that terror was for the child in my womb. Every fall, every partial suffocation, every enemy encounter, every time I passed out, every time I went through a portal, every time I touched flesh residue, every time the shadow consumed me and turned me into a monster, all I felt was fear for my child. If something happened to me, then she would never be born, and that's all the value that my life had. The game tricked me into thinking that I'd be giving birth to some sort of monster, but that didn't even matter. Amari was all I had left. She's the reason that I left that first cave and set off to find my group's doctor, Anton Metzier. We get out of this. I promise you, you won't be born in the dark. Let's talk about some other psychological horror games for a moment. I'll try not to spoil any of them. Silent Hill 2 is commonly touted as the greatest horror game ever made, and it's easy to see why. It's about a man who's lost everything. The only thing that keeps him from killing himself is this idea that he can still atone for an awful thing he did out of his own hubris and lust. Amnesia, The Dark Descent is about a man who tried so hard to forget his past, only to find that by forgetting it, he enabled himself to repeat his mistakes. Amnesia, A Machine for Pigs is about a man who was so disgusted by humanity that he became a murderer, and he learns to have more faith in humanity as he loses faith in himself. Soma is about a man struggling with the definition of life, trying to figure out if his actions are transforming him into a monster, or if he's just messing with data on a computer. These are all fantastic horror premises, and all of these have incredibly powerful moments where the themes of the story work their way into the gameplay, and we get to really play the same fear we're experiencing through the narrative. However, these are just moments. Sure, the games as a whole are scary to play, with vulnerable player characters, terrifying visuals and sound design and all of that, but you could take the gameplay of Silent Hill 2 and mix it with the story of The Dark Descent, and the resultant game would be more or less equally as effective as The Dark Descent is on its own. Scary gameplay mixed with a scary and meaningful story. The story is giving more to the experience than the gameplay is. As fantastically designed as all of these games are, this isn't a perfect marriage between story and gameplay. Well, now let's go back to Amnesia Rebirth so that I can explain why I think it's the most elegantly crafted horror game I've ever played. So, if Soma is about a man struggling with the definition of life while being forced to try and define it, then Amnesia Rebirth is about a mother's fear that something will happen to her child. Amnesia Rebirth creates that all-important marriage between narrative and gameplay through two simple game mechanics that have been crafted and balanced incredibly well. We'll start out with the more familiar mechanic, sanity, or in this game, fear. In the original Amnesia, staring at enemies, witnessing horrifying things, or sitting in the dark for too long would decrease your sanity, which led to a whole host of consequences. Your vision becoming distorted and blurry, your mouse movements becoming sluggish, cockroaches crawling on your screen, auditory hallucinations, even certain paintings would change based on how clear your head was, all leading up to you collapsing on the floor, alerting nearby enemies to your position, and being forced to crawl on your hands and knees until you can come back from the edge. In a genius bit of design, the only way to recover sanity was to stand in the light, where enemies can see you, or to make progress on your objectives. In Amnesia Rebirth, however, you have some horrible disease, which I'll call the Shadow. As your stress level increases, you slowly start to lose hold of yourself as the shadow takes over, causing many of the same effects as in the first game. However, instead of simply collapsing on the ground, the shadow completely transforms you into some psychopathic monster. 
All you see are flashes of memories mixed in with quick glimpses of yourself running angrily through the corridors that surround you, ultimately waking up from your fevered state in a room that you'd been in earlier, setting your progress back a little ways. Since we're dealing with any form of stress rather than pure fear, enemy attacks don't kill you or damage your health, they add to your stress. What this means is that any combination of being stressed and being attacked by an enemy will lead to you finally snapping, the shadow taking hold of you for a few moments, and you waking up in another part of the area. This is all a very elegant way to keep true game overs from being a thing, which is good because nothing ruins the stakes of a game like seeing yourself die and coming back perfectly fine, but what's truly genius about it is the means by which you prevent yourself from being consumed by the shadow, the second of the two essential game mechanics I mentioned earlier, your child. Amnesia Rebirth is all about the horror of childbearing, and the way that your pregnancy is used in gameplay is what transforms the experience from a well-done horror story with some terrifying gameplay to a great work of horror, in which every piece is essential. While game mechanics like matches, fear, and safe rooms are all fantastic at creating those iconic amnesia moments where you lock yourself in a room staring at a candle to hold on to a sliver of your sanity, the real star of the show in Rebirth is the Soothe button. After the reveal that you're pregnant, you can, at any time, rub your belly, talking to your child. In classic amnesia fashion, the effect of this is left ambiguous. The implication is that it helps you stave off the shadow. The baby will kick from time to time, indicating that rubbing your belly will help some, but the rest of the time, I really can't say for certain if rubbing your belly does anything whatsoever. But that alone was enough to have me crouched in corners, scared out of my mind, rubbing my belly constantly, just trying to keep myself from going over the edge. The image of Daniel locking himself in a room, barricading the door with chairs just so that he could stare at the fickle flame of a single candle, muttering curses and prayers under his breath to stay sane was incredibly impactful. But the image of a mother crouched in a dark corner, unable to see more than a foot or two in any direction, whispering lullabies to her pregnant belly through quivering voice, imagining horrible scenes of the murderous thing on the other side of the paper-thin wall hearing her breath and ripping her and her child limb from limb is downright powerful. This was all amplified by the simple fact that I might have been the greatest threat to my child. Whatever I had, there was a good chance she had it too, and that her infantile body would be less able to combat it. But what's worse than that? The disease kept turning me into a violent psychopath. Who's to say I want to end up clawing apart my own womb in anger, or smothering the poor child moments after she was born, or in a violent delusion, pick a fight that I just couldn't win? While the baby was the only thing keeping me from losing it and becoming a monster, she wasn't perfectly effective. I still became a monster over and over again, and each time it was totally possible that I would end up putting my child's life in danger or ending it myself. Then you've got one other matter. See, a little ways into the game, I was shocked to see that my womb had grown by over a month in just a matter of hours. It wasn't much longer before it had grown by another month, then another still. At this rate, I would be going from first trimester to broken water in no less than a day. This presented me with two problems. Firstly, I absolutely had to get myself out of this situation before my water broke, or else there would be no point to any of this. But more important than even that, just what the hell was I impregnated with? This was a question that was spinning around my mind every time I went to rub my belly for comfort, every time I talked to my child through the womb, telling her that everything would be okay. Children don't grow up that fast. I'm infected by some horrible disease related to the darkness that follows everyone that meddles with the orbs, and my child was most definitely affected by it as well. So what sort of abomination would I be giving birth to in a few hours? In the dark descent, light was my source of comfort. It made me more visible to enemies, sure, but I knew exactly what the pros and cons were. Here, my main source of comfort might be hours away from tearing itself out of my womb and ripping my heart out. It might be preparing to die right in front of me in order to push me over the edge and let the shadow consume me wholly. It might be... Well, regardless of what it might be, it was comforting me then, and it would only be right that I nurture it until it's done with me or my disease is done with it. I'll never be a mother, but this horror is exactly what I see in the eyes of every sane mother that I've met. A deep, everlasting horror that's integrated itself into their lives so constantly that it's become able to disguise itself as melancholy. A constant fear that the worst will happen, brought on by the cross of a never-ending protective role towards a creature that doesn't want to be protected. This begs the question, why? Why would a person ever put themselves through motherhood, and what did they do to deserve that horror? Amnesia games are fundamentally about a person confronting past mistakes and learning the depth of their evil nature. Well, what was my evil? What had I done wrong? The answer begins with a question. What is the value of a human life? Surely it depends on the human in question and who's answering the question, but I think that the only way we can get to an even remotely consistent answer is by asking mothers. Every healthy mother I've ever met would end the world to save their child. They would risk everything. They would kill or be killed. They would accept eternal damnation. 
To make a promise like this to yourself and to your child, that's horror. To act on that promise, that's a waking nightmare. As I made my way to the town that my group's doctor was contacting me from, I slowly, piece by piece, learned that I had traveled some of these paths before. I remembered the pure hatred that my group had for me, and eventually, after hours and hours of horror, my water broke. I had to crawl my failing body across the desert as quickly as I could, crying out in labor pains, until eventually I made it to the doctor in the town. After delivering my child, he told me that I was a monster and he ran off with Amari. Naturally, I gave chase, wondering in the back of my head what I had done to drive these people to child abduction. What made me so awful a person that I didn't deserve my child after working so hard to protect her? Well, I was able to keep up with the doctor long enough to follow him into a rift before it closed behind him, and there I was at the bottom of the temple in the other world, where so many generations of people were being tortured, their fear being converted into the vitae that kept the empress of this ancient civilization alive for all of these thousands of years, the ultimate monument to how much value one can give a human life. I myself had tortured one such person to stabilize my child's condition with their vitae. Surely I had no business being sick at what I was witnessing. As I moved through the bottom levels of the temple, it finally came to me. I remembered what I had done despite Dr. Metzier and the rest of my group. Previously, the Empress had offered to return my group to safety so long as I stayed behind and gave my daughter to her. I refused, damning my group to their twisted, horrific deaths at the hands of this desert. I had put a single, fickle human life over those of nearly a dozen people. I had killed and tortured in the name of my daughter. I had begun to make good on the promise to put my child over everything. The Empress gave our group the disease that we all suffered so much from, the disease which turned out to be terminal for all but myself, and cast us out of her realm back into the desert, and in her fractured benevolence she gave to me the amulet that allowed me to return to her with wavering faith in my state of mind and a child who was suddenly, shockingly ready to be born. Dr. Metzier had stolen my child to try again at the deal, my child for his safety, a wrong righted. In my rage, the shadow consumed me until I smashed his head over the edge of a stone footpath. All that was left was to recover my child. Finally, it was just myself and the Empress, and she revealed why she wanted my child to begin with. Like my firstborn daughter, Elise, Amari was born with a terminal illness. The only way to save her would be to keep her on the life support of the Empress's endless supply of Vitae from her tortured subjects. I had doomed my entire group to save this child. I had personally tortured the innocent and killed the horrified, all in the name of keeping this single infant safe. And now, I had the option to save her once and for all from her otherwise inevitable adolescent death. I had to choose whether or not to make good on a mother's promise to her child to put their safety above all else. I had to choose whether or not the torture of thousands could be justified by the well-being of my daughter. Ultimately, I chose to go against the pattern of offering my daughter greater and greater sacrifices. I chose not to let my daughter's life be extended by the suffering of thousands. But the whole time I was making this decision, I wasn't thinking of all those people being tortured in their pods. I was thinking of what was best for my daughter. I didn't spare a second thought for the thousands of people around me praying for death. My only concern was making sure that my daughter had a happy life. And as I thought of my first daughter, Elise's laughter, and the joy that she had lived through before her untimely death, all I could conclude was that I wanted the same for Amari. She may live to be five years old, she may live to be two weeks old, but one thing was certain, she was going to die holding on to her mother, rather than live long enough to be sickened by all that was sacrificed to her. To protect her child, a mother will do anything, and I mean anything, and committing to that anything might be the greatest horror imaginable. It's dark, Mama. It's all dark. Shh. It's all right, little one.
Now that the video is over, I'd like to, as always, verbally thank my patrons for always just helping me out and supporting me with all of this, letting me do more uh, daring and interesting videos. Especially those donating $10 or more monthly, such as Ahoy Bowie Polly K, Alex Van Der Wood, Almost Dead Again, Anatoly Volnov, Andrew Melnick, Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Big Time Jim, Colin Gajic, Cooper Sutton, Corbet Godwin, Cosmo Borsky, Daniel Christman, Darius Fazier, David Kaiser, Duncan Bristow, Freylum, Jack Eisenberg, Jano, John Strange, J.P. De La Torre, J.W., Max Binning, Mixer Rules, Money and Muses, Patio Furniture, Cielo, Silver Silence, Vladimir's Noldholm, Wolf HD, and Young Master Pig. October has been an absolutely crazy month for me. I even had to take a week off to focus on some other projects, which I will hopefully get to talk more about later. Uh, but uh, in spite of it all, everything worked out in the end. And uh, I think that this was a great month for the channel. I, I really like the stuff I got to put out this month. And uh, beyond even that, there's some very exciting stuff that I uh, absolutely cannot wait to talk to you guys about that's happening. Not videos, not like me signing up with Machinima or anything like that. Just really cool stuff that I don't want to get, that I don't want to speak out of turn and talk about yet. Uh, but it's coming, and it's sick, and I've seen some of it, and it's awesome. Uh, anyways, thank you for watching, and uh, happy Halloween.